Welcome everyone to Inference Swap. Isn't that good music? Love it. Welcome to Inference Swap, which is inferenceswap.com, where we host many shows like Table Talk with me, your host today, John Pappas. Table Talk is a show about God's mission and discipleship, and we're inviting you to learn as we talk around the table with people and through this mic with you. Welcome to the show. My name is John Pappas. I'm excited to be here with you today. Hey, listen, Table Talk is back to its original format where we're just going to talk about getting with people around a table and giving them the good news, having some food and drink, and being able to understand who we are as God's church and what we should do as God's people. And so today, we're going to continue in our book of John as we dis- dis- discover what it means to be a disciple. Now, previously we had talked, I think it was uh, John 1, 32 through 135. And um, what we found, just to refresh and get right into it, is that in our last discussion about this, Jesus doesn't fit the mold of what we think he is supposed to be. He's not a religious Jesus, and he surely isn't this free-for-all spirituality Jesus. He isn't asking you for religious loyalty and then thrusting upon you a bunch of rules, rites, and rituals. And at the same time, he didn't leave any of us or he didn't hand off to his disciples this vague sense of spirituality that basically is utterly relativistic and based on ourselves and on, on humans. In other words, he didn't say, hey, whatever works for you works for you and whatever works for me works for me. Instead, we see a different Jesus, a Jesus with boots on the ground that invites us into his life, invites us, as he puts it in our last discussion in the book of John, to come and see, which means come and think, think and weigh all the evidence. And then in turn, as you come into this relationship, he invites you not only into his life, but into his death and resurrection, but he starts to show you that he's for real and what God is like. So we learn that he gave us the faculties to think and to follow him. And he gave us the freedom to ask, to doubt, to seek, to seek the truth and struggle with it. Because his number one priority is relationship, guys. It's loving you, showing you what he's like in that love and in that expression, and the depth of the relationship that he wants to have with you. That was what we talked about last time. And it's important that we have this come and see kind of reality in our own discipleship, that we're inviting people into our lives. Well, today we're going to move forward into John 1, I think it is, let me look that up real quick. It's 135 to 142. And we're going to take a look at this through the visual Bible. So if you're listening to it on a podcast, you're going to hear some spaces, if you will, in dramatic music and sounds. But all of the scripture from verses 35 to 42 are there. So take a listen. And we're going to talk about the question of what it means to be a disciple. But first, take a look at John 135 through 42. The next day, John was standing there again with two of his disciples when he saw Jesus walking by. There's the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and went with Jesus. Jesus turned, saw them following him. What are you looking for? Uh, um, where do, where you live? do you live? Rabbi. Rabbi. This word means teacher. Come and see. It was then about four o'clock in the afternoon, so they went with him and saw where he lived and spent the rest of that day with him. One of them was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. At once he found his brother Simon. 
We have found the Messiah. This word means Christ. Then he took Simon to Jesus. Jesus looked at him. Your name is Simon, son of John. But you will be called Cephas. This is the same as Peter and means a rock. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip. And said to him, Come with me. Philip was from Bethsaida, a town where Andrew and Peter lived. Philip found Nathaniel. We have found the one whom Moses wrote about in the book of the law, and whom the prophets also wrote about. He is Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, he said about him, Here is a real Israelite. There is nothing false in him. How do you know me? I saw you when you were under the fig tree before Philip called you. Israel. Do you believe just because I told you I saw you when you were under the fig tree? You will see much greater things than this. I am telling you the truth. You will see heaven open and God's angels going up and coming down on the Son of Man. Wow, so here we are. If uh, you heard the music there at the end, that was uh, Nathaniel sort of reflecting that Jesus saw him by the tree. But here we are with John 1, 35 through 42. And what we find and what we're discovering is that there is a struggle. This is, by the way, this is Jesus calling his disciples, okay? And um, that's what we want to talk about. What does it mean to be a disciple? So I'm a little bit all over, all over the place there for a second, but I was getting my thoughts in order, so forgive me there. But when I was looking back on my life, when I was thinking about what it means to be a disciple... I began to reflect and I, I looked over my, my life and my religious upbringing and I found that at the heart of my humanity, there's always been this skepticism and that skepticism moves me forward one way or the other. Um, so while my humanity is curious about things, specifically philosophical questions like who am I and, and uh, is there a God, um, my skepticism always seems to find me. And that's, I think, the humanity of a current culture, that while we're asking big questions, we're always, re we're always rejecting those big questions and coming back to ourselves. 
But what I've discovered, especially going through my years as a missionary, as Chi Alpha missionary, that what I determine about God really decides who I will be, and it really decides what I will do in every single area of my life. It decides truly how I will literally move forward in my life, whether I believe or I don't believe. And so there's many of us that ask these questions that are philosophical and theological about God. When we think about um, these things in an evolutionary philosophy, in a Christian philosophy, in a worldview, there's these big questions that we're confronted with and we have to come to a grips with some of these in order to move in the right direction. And one of the questions I found myself asking is when I did come to the terms of believing in God is do I want to take my own safety, my own happiness and submit that to a higher power? Do I want to put my family through? Uh, behind a higher power? Do I want to let that higher power determine who I am and inform who I am? Can I allow that higher power to, uh, in other words, God, can I put that above my allegiances in this world, my politics, my principles, my values that I've defined? Um, and when I looked at that, specifically when I was on campus where all these different worldviews and ideologies exist, um, I began to find what is it really, I began to ask, like, what does it really mean to be courageous in this venue of philosophy and theology and finding out who I am and who God is and, and how that affects my life? And what I began to realize is when I can put God above all else, above my family, above my allegiances in this world, above those principles and politics and, and values that I've defined, that's really what it means to be courageous. It's not courageous to do the things that you're supposed to do. It's to do the things you're supposed to do. I mean, in good times, it's, it's to do those things all the time, right? But I also ran into this problem in the modern world, especially on a college campus, because they shift the question, these questions of who is God and who am I because of it, they shift this question when we're seeking to find ourselves and what it means to be human. For the first time, they've shifted what that question is and what the uh, end result or the meaning of that question is, or the sum of that question is for the first time in history. Instead of asking what informs who I am or who informs what I am, um, we find that modern society and modern man removes the principles of faith. They move the reality of truth as something discovered outside of ourselves, and they define it um, as something different. For the first time, humanity now doesn't look outside of itself for that truth or outside of that self to discover who they are. They're now looking at the inner self and defining reality from that inner man and projecting it outside to the outside world. It tries to find who they are through feelings and through desires. And it seeks as its highest goal to fulfill them. So in modern thinking, I mean, think about this. In modern thinking, real courage means to go and find yourself and go and be yourself and Put it out there in the world. It means to never look outside of what you feel or how you feel or look past your own desires to find fulfillment. So it really what we're finding now in modern humanity, they're ditching truth outside of one's own reality in one's own claim of how he defines that reality. And he's laying aside the claim that Things from the outside can place expectations on him because that would prevent him from finding his true self. And taking that journey to the modern man is how they define courage. Isn't that interesting? And I literally at Butler campus went through that intellectual journey to find not on only who I am, but where these kids and where modern man was coming from. And ultimately, when it comes down to modern man, 
what I found when it comes to religion, specifically Jesus or the person of Jesus portrayed in Scripture, that that Jesus is utterly reprehensible to them. Now, we see this play out, and I never noticed it before. We see this play out not only in, in art. Think of art from, from back uh, when it began to today and what it's turned into. Follow the path and you'll get a wide awakening. But also we see it in movies today. Remember the temptation of Christ where um, Christ is portrayed as human struggling with his uh, uh, struggling with his very inner being to be the man that he wants to be over the person God's called him to be. And that that higher struggle was really his desire to get married and his sexuality and his desires for sexual fulfillment. You see, that is modern man's idol placed on Jesus. But isn't that what we do? We take what we want to believe and we put it on the God that we want and we serve that God. And ultimately, Jesus not only rejects that, not only is not that, but he shows us God. And what we find in Christ is the archetype for the most selfless love. And that's revolting to to modern man. Jesus is selfless through and through. Selfless. He gave his life up for you and I. And that's revolting to someone who wants to self-divine every area in their life and who wants to find their inner person that lives by their feelings and desires, right? And so this is why it's a problem in America for discipleship because the attitudes of selfishness has seeped its way in. I mean, American individualism is just that. Um, our allegiance sometimes culturally, whether we understand it or know it or not, is literally individualistic and selfish, right? And so we don't have the ability to give up our will because our will is to serve self. And so what we're finding now in this time, in this day and age, and this has everything to do with the scripture that we just heard or read or watched in John 135 through 42, is that America has a discipleship problem because in our culture, in the American West, we define what it means to be human. And what's crazy I mean, and this is really crazy. What we have accepted and defined as what it means to be human is literally what put Jesus on the cross. It is literally why Jesus went to the cross. It's literally what he died for. In other words, we take what God looks at as sinful and dead, and we embrace it and try to find life in that. And so we find that that is a huge issue for discipleship in American West. Discipleship means to subjugate our present desi desires for the sake of the future, of something more noble, of good things in the future and good causes in the future. It's to put our faith forward and put footsteps to that faith. A Christian disciple is someone who says um, that all other pursuits are secondary to serving and knowing Jesus. Now, think about that in American West culture that embraces American individualism, that embraces self-defining and self-reflection and its own desires over all else and thinks that's what life is and should that's how life should be experienced. But it, when it comes to the church and God's people, if we're struggling in our American individualism or in the West's individualism or in our selfish ways and our, our primary purpose is that discovery of self, we're in for a rude awakening because Jesus' own word says, if you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. He says, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. That's right out of scripture, Matthew 10, 38, 39. And what that means is if you're struggling with who you are, the question of who am I, and you try to make and self-fulfill that question, who am I? You make that your chief priority in life. You will never find it. 
If you think it's more important to seek in yourself and to find who you are more than it is to find that answer in God, what you will find is a constant cycle in your life of not only struggle, but shame, guilt, and for sure disappointment. You'll get that screw it mentality. And here's the crazy thing. The desire of your heart will never be fulfilled. It will never be filled, let alone fulfilled. And we see this in the world all the time. So in the American West, we have this struggle with the culture real, cultural reality of who we are as American, as individuals, as people that live and self-prioritize self and feelings and uh, desires, and this battle of discipleship that God has called us into. And so that begs the question, what does it mean to be a disciple? And, and the answer to that question is more than just this religious or philosophical question, although it, it, it is definitely theological and philosophical, because that answer is an answer to life. It's an answer to our lives. It's the answer that brings life in life, if you will. And in this scripture, we see three big things that is happening, even though it seems like subtle scripture. What we find is that Jesus not only came to us, but he's calling us. And then he's asking us to follow him. And then he's calling us to an adventure, to something. And so often... We don't see that. But today we're just going to talk about one of those things. We're not So in that scripture we just read, or you just watched, we see that Jesus calls us, that he's calling, I'm sorry, that Jesus calls us, that he asks us to follow him, and then he calls us to something. Well, today we're going to talk about Jesus calling us. And what we find in the gospel narrative as we're looking at this, is that Andrew and John were with John the Baptist, who had, it seems that he's been teaching them about the coming Messiah, about his purpose of pointing to that Messiah. And so they're waiting for that moment for that Messiah to arrive. They had no idea it was going to be Jesus. But when John sees Jesus, he points to him. There's the Lamb of God. And he says, that's the one whose shoes is, I'm not even worthy to tie. I baptize with water. He baptized with the power of the Holy Spirit. And so when John points to Jesus, they decide to go find him and confront him. And Jesus literally turns to them and calls them not to a temple, not to a worship service, not to a synagogue, not to a meeting, but he calls them into his life and says, come and see. And this is a great moment for us to pause on. Because it's a great example of how we all come to Jesus. We all are walking along and we have this idea of what God is like. We've, ha we've heard what Christianity, what we think it is. And maybe we're exploring it or maybe we're not. But we have these questions of who am I and who is God? And we find that somewhere along the way, if we pursue that truth, if we knock on that door, God shows up. And he leads you to him. He calls us. It's a great example of that truth. One day we're just awoke. We went from being woke people that self-defined to awakened to the reality of God. And what we find when we look at scripture that God was already working on John and Andrew in John the Baptist prior to Jesus' coming. They didn't know. They knew there was going to be a Messiah, but they had no idea what they were going to put their faith in yet. And in the same way, if you look at Israelite scriptural in the Old Testament, that all that scripture is foreshadowing and pointing to the Messiah, and then Jesus shows up. So what we're learning here is that God is working on people right now in our reality, in our circles right now before we get there. And we have to understand that God isn't limited to our understandings of religion or Christian culture. He's not uh, limited to our thinking that he's working on the world around us in order that we can be the people that he's called us to be. And so what we find is if we will 
embrace that and work with God in this area, then all of a sudden you'll see people around you begin to come into belief because God has been working on him. And so this is true and worthy of taking note. It's God's kingdom and Jesus who has sown God's kingdom into this world already. And disciples heed the call of Jesus, meaning they come to him because he's called them, but they also become aware of what, how that happened. In other words, like God had been working on them all along. And so it shows us that in our neighborhoods and in the culture around us and at the pub and at the restaurant and at the bowling alley and karate and in the softball games, God is working on people everywhere. Isn't that amazing? Now, here's the other side of that coin. And this is something that we religious folk need to take into real, really pay attention here. That while Jesus is working on everyone and disciples awaken to the reality of that call that he has been working on us and that we begin to realize that he's working on those around us, we find that Jesus is also very particular about those he calls. And it almost seems like as you watch and follow this story move along, that he's very almost fearful of those around them. Um, a lot of people in the New Testament really wanted to, quote, be with Jesus. They wanted to see, they see him in his power. They see this power working in the world like nothing else before. They hear this message of inclusion. Think about that. The religious people started with a, a message of exclusion and all these rules in order to be in. Jesus starts with a message of inclusion through grace to the least of the people, to the lost people, and to the last people that anybody would ever talk to in this world. Yet Jesus himself, in all that, has a fear of those people that come to him and say, I'll follow you. I'm with you, right? Now, how do I know this? Well, I'm going to give you an example. Right after Jesus heals, this is out of the book of Matthew, and I'm going to look at the scripture. I think it's, so you can look at Matthew 18, I'm sorry, 8, 19 through 20. And so the couple verses before 19, we find that Jesus was, he heals Peter's mom, and then he casts demons out of some people, heals a lot of other people, the Bible says. But then all of a sudden, when people see this, they all want a piece of Jesus, right? He's like a rock star of the day. And they all want to hang out with him. And they start confronting him about doing that. And Jesus' response is crazy. It's not what you think it is. He says something like this. He says, uh, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to raise his head. Now, you would expect Jesus to go, yeah, sure, come on, follow me. Let's hang out. Let's do this. No. Jesus's mission was to continually go forward to the lost, last, and least of these, right? And he wasn't look. He was the one that going to call his disciples to him. Notice the word disciple. He is. He's warning these people that they don't understand the cost. He's warning these people that there's a price to following Jesus, to being a true disciple. You see, Jesus wanted disciples and legitimate followers, and he was very skeptical of those that just hung around. And that's telling. And we religious folk need to literally at this time embrace Scripture. We really need to dig into our hearts and see where we are. And what scripture is pointing out here is that Jesus isn't looking for a fan base. This isn't Facebook and YouTube where Jesus is expecting likes. He's literally warning people that if you're going to follow me, you must come and die. Right? Is it possible that some of us are like these people that are just wanting to hang around Jesus? Is it possible that maybe you are someone who likes Jesus, who hangs around Jesus, or but you're not really a disciple? And I think Jesus really, if we follow him, he really is 
poignant in particular that he's not interested in, in religious observers. But he's religious to those who respond to the call of discipleship. So what we're confronted here today with is the question of what is a disciple? And what we're finding is it's not interested observers. It's not those who love the crowd because we know that Jesus can pull in a crowd, right? Wherever he went, he was pulling around crowds and they're asking to follow him. And he's saying, listen, you don't even know what you're asking. You don't even know what the mission is. Have you any idea what grace is? Do you realize that you're going to have to come and die? You see, there's a lot of people that like a crowd. There's a lot of people that are attracted to personalities. I call them pulpit personalities. They look to the person for inspiration, not Jesus. And so they're willing to do religious rites and rituals, but they're not willing to be disciples. And the problem with religion is it keeps you alive. It puts rules on top of rules to keep you alive instead of dying to self. There's other people out there that really like the sense of spiritual power and they like being around Jesus because of that, but they never pick up the call to come and die and be a disciple. You see, Jesus calls us and he's asking us to leave all else behind, to die to that stuff, to die to the religious nature, to die to that selfish spirituality, to die to the one that is trying to define their inner self. He's trying to say, you need to make me a priority. You need to take up your cross and you need to die. He isn't asking for your belief. He isn't asking you to hang out. He isn't asking you to be enamored by his spiritual power. He's asking you to come and die. He's saying, if you come and see and you hang with me and you put your footsteps and faith in me and trust in me, I will show you not only who I am, but who you really are. Think about that when we're asking the question, who am I? The one who created you and calls you to his life knows the real you. And the Bible says Jesus looked at, for example, Simon. Remember this scripture? He says, and it's in that, that, that thing that we just listened to. Remember Peter or Simon comes to him and he says, You're the, your name is Simon, son of John, but now you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. And what is that telling us? That Jesus, in his calling, he holds the potentials of all of us right before us and says, come and see what I'm going to do if you will die. But see, we have to move from this quasi-belief and these hangers on to religion into the discipleship that he's called us to be disciples. How about that? Is that crazy? Jesus has called us for more, but to get more, we have to die. We have to become less. It is absolutely crazy. So what have we learned here today? Well, Guys, we learned that discipleship is, is really about laying down, stop being religious. It's really about following Jesus, putting all your trust in him and leaving everything else behind. It's understanding that there's a cost. It's understanding that Jesus isn't into the tryhards. He's not looking to be, quote, liked. He came to be in relationship with you, but that happens not only as he is died and resurrected for you, but that you follow him to that cross and allow him to kill you and you so that you can find you. <laughs> isn't that crazy? There's too many interested observers in the religion of Christianity, but very, very few respond to the call of discipleship. And so we're confronted today with this question of what is discipleship? Is Are we interested observers? Are we just a guy that likes Jesus on his Facebook? Or are we, are we fans? Or are we willing to come and die? Do we realize that foxes have holes and birds 
have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to rest his head. In other words, God is working all around us and he's calling us into that work. Isn't that crazy? Discipleship. What is discipleship? So I leave you with this today. As I think about what discipleship is, the Bible says if you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life, you will find it. That can only happen through Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you as I challenge you and challenge some of your belief. As you're trying to self-discover, I want to encourage you to die to that thing, to come to Christ, allow him to move in your life and trust in him completely and fully. And He got you have the promise on the other side that your heart will be filled. You'll be filled with the purposes, the meaning, significance, and value that only God can give. You will be filled with the desires of your heart that only God can give. And that happens as we move from being um, a hanger-on, somebody who's hanging in the crowd, somebody who's, who's observing religiously, and we get in the game. We say, Lord, here I am. Take me. I'll go where I'll go. I'll go where you will call me. Isn't that awesome? That's what it means to be a disciple. I think that is great. We have to learn to subjugate our present desires for the sake of what God has us for us on the other side of that cross. That's really what it means. We're going to pursue God, knowing Him and His purposes and His passion. And we're going to make that primary in our life and every other pursuit is secondary. All right. I'm out of here. Thank you guys for watching. I hope this informs you. I hope this will stir you. And I hope more than anything, you will take a step into discipleship more than as information, but into a reality that God wants you to walk in, in order that you may find out who you are in Christ Jesus. Guys, I love you. I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm glad that Table Talk is back. Until the next time, I will ask you to uh, come back, subscribe, and follow us on InferenceSwap.com where you can get the latest and greatest shows like Table Talk with me, your host, John Pappas. Love you guys. I will see you on the flip side. Go to InferenceSwap.com now and subscribe.